Welcome everyone to today's webinar on the flagship waste treatment facility at uh, Phoenixville. Uh, we're fortunate to be presented by Jeremy Taylor, their um, chief architect, our chief technology officer. But this uh, webinar is being brought to you by the Sierra Club's conservation teams of clean energy and water quality. As you can see on the screen, we have eight conservation teams that look at a lot of statewide issues. So if you're interested in volunteering to uh, join any of these teams, feel free to, uh, I'll put the uh, link in the chat and we're, we're happy to have your participation in our ongoing discussions as we try to evolve how Pennsylvania is looking at these topics. So I'm gonna stop sharing and allow Jeremy to start. I just want to mention, uh, we're going to have the chat for to the host during the presentation, and then after the Q and A, we'll open it up uh, so you can interact. So feel free to get started, Jeremy. Oh, are you able to unmute? Yeah, there you go. And I wanted to find the unmute button before I started talking. Um, Bill, thank you for the opportunity to talk about um, what I've been working on and Semex has been working on for five to 10 years, depending on how long you've been at the company. Um, it's really an honor to be able to speak to you, the Sierra Club, and uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so as Bill said, we'll be talking about the water treatment process at the Phoenixville Wastewater Treatment Plant. Um, talking about hydrothermal carbonization, and Phoenixville has dubbed it the PXV NEO. Um, so, getting into it, um, we're going to be talking about the basics of wastewater treatment plant and the status quo, um, fundamentals of HTC, try to get you all educated on what hydrothermal carbonization is and how it impacts biomass. Um, and then we're going to talk about the development um, at Borough Phoenixville Wastewater Treatment Plant. First, a little bit of intro about myself. Um, my name is Jeremy Taylor. I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer at SOMAC Circular Solutions. I have a bachelor's in chemical engineering and a master's in sustainable engineering from Villanova, um, where I was introduced to this process and uh, began my research. Um, been at the company for about five years now, and um, I've watched the process at the Borough of Phoenix School go from, from lab scale to constructed commercial scale development, um, and it's been a, a real real awesome career opportunity. And I'm happy to share, share about it. Um, so SOMAX um, partnered with Villanova in 2015 with their School of Sustainable Engineering and has since uh, sponsored about eight master's students um, going complete through their thesis on the topics of HTC. Um, from that partnership with Villanova, um, we've really built this process uh, from the lab scale up and understanding the products made from it and characterizing different feedstocks and how they're impacted from the, the reaction. Um, over the years, we've done a number of um, challenges, um, one being the manure challenge, uh, looking at dairy manure. Uh, we were a winner of the Water Resource Recovery Prize that's been on by the U.S. Department of Energy, and they were seeking to scale or seeking scalable and repeatable solutions uh, for implementation at wastewater treatment plants, looking to recover 50% more resources from uh, wastewater. Uh, back in 2019, we were awarded the design build contract with the borough of Phoenixville to implement our commercial scale HTC process. Um, and 2023 this year, we successfully commissioned the process and we are waiting for uh, one or two components to get in uh, before we go into full startup mode. Um, we also do work outside of the manure space. Um, in 2021, we were a winner of the Diageo Low Carbon Heat Challenge, which was looking at distillery residues and converting that to hydrochar and powering their uh, distillation processes. So let's get into it. So wastewater treatment is uh, pivotal for a society to function and, and be a healthy society. Um, people often overlook it, but it's a very cool and involved process. And the more I've been in the industry, the more I've, I've learned to appreciate it. Um, in wastewater treatment, there's really three uh, types of treatment. Primary treatment, which is the removal of solids. So answering our question, how do you remove or pre-sort plastic and material that gets flushed down the toilet? 
at wastewater treatment plants, there are screens, bar screens, uh, and grit chambers at the beginning of wastewater treatment that removes um, some of the heavier materials or rags, um, anything that gets flushed down the toilet. All of those flushable wipes mostly get pulled out of the screens at the headworks of the plant. Um, after solids removal, there's secondary treatment, which is essentially the water treatment portion of it, um, where we have biological processes that run the nitrification, denitrification cycle. And from that, you get an activated sludge, and that activated sludge is the um, micro microbes that essentially do the nitrification, denitrification, denitrification cycle and um, populate. And those get taken out in the clarifier and make their way out with the rest of the solids in the process or go back up into the aeration basins. The tertiary treatment is disinfection and treatment that sends it back out to um, rivers and tributaries. Um, but we're going to be focusing on the sludge treatment and disposal portion of wastewater treatment today, really focusing in on biosolids, um, sewage sludge treatment. So this is um, the results of a 2018 biosolid study that looked at each state um, across the U.S. and characterized their biosolids disposal practices. Um, you can see that in the left, in the state of Pennsylvania, the majority of biosolids is used for agriculture. What that means is it's land applied for non-human crops, so typically land applied for crops intended for animals. Um, about 31% goes to landfill and about 22% goes to incineration where it's just obliterated in an incinerator, typically with no energy recovery associated to it. And these percentages don't vary too far off from the United States averages on the right. Um, you see a lot more class AEQ generation around the US than you do in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, so looking at how HDC or hydrothermal carbonization uh, compares to some of those standard organic waste solutions. Um, we look at, at three, really two metrics, carbon efficiency, which is the amount of carbon available in the final product that was in the original feedstock. In landfilling, carbon efficiency is essentially zero. Um, you get very little benefit from that unless there is landfill gas catching on that. Um, we're starting to see with states in the Northeast a ban on landfilling of biosolids. This is due to high nitrogen content, or high, sorry, high water content, which causes leaching issues. Um, and one of the things that I found out is that too, many, too much organics into a landfill can actually create landfill geysers. So they just turn into a molten mess in the middle of a landfill and actually geyser up out. Um, I was really flabbergasted when I learned that. Um, if you use composting for organic waste, you get about a 10% carbon efficiency, meaning 10% of the carbon in that original feedstock makes its way to that final compost product in the soil amendment. This takes about 12 weeks and requires a decent amount of land mass to do, um, especially at large scale. Um, anaerobic digestion, which is the main process that is used for biosolids. Um, valorization has a carbon efficiency of about 50%. And takes 15 to 40 days to do. So you need some very large tankage to be able to hold that material for that amount of time. Um, the biogas that's generated from it is about 60, 40 methane CO2 um, and can be beneficially used. It can be upgraded to RNG. Um, a lot of that infrastructure is not in place at wastewater treatment plants, especially small to medium-sized wastewater treatment plants across the U.S. Um, how that stacks up to HTC we get about a 90% or up to a 90% carbon efficiency, meaning up to 90% of that carbon in the original feedstock is present in that hydrochar product on the back end. And we'll touch more on what hydrochar actually is. Um, the process duration of HTC is about 30 minutes to four hours. So we're able to have a very high throughput on a small footprint. Um, this is a, a key factor in being able to expand solids treatment at a wastewater treatment plant. Um, is this quick duration and allowing for higher throughput on a lower footprint area. So I've said it a bit now, but what is hydrothermal carbonization? Breaking down the name, it's a process that takes place in a wet environment, hydro. Uh, you have added heat to it, so it's a thermal process. 
And the overarching process or goal is to carbonize the material, making it have a higher carbon density in the original feedstock, which increases its stability and ability to um, act as a carbon sequestration event. Um, the temperatures that we use are about 180 to 220 Celsius, which is um, about 420 Fahrenheit. So no more than you bake with at home, but we have autogenic pressures um, to keep that liquid in liquid phase. So we're above boiling, but we're at high enough pressures to keep that material from boiling. And we, the water is in a subcritical state. Um, in a subcritical state, the water is highly reactive and facilitates the majority of the carbonization reactions um, throughout the process. The products of HTC, uh, we have a biosolution or the process water that can be sent back to an anaerobic digester to create biogas. You can also have selective nutrient recovery from that process water, increasing the number of resources recovered from the solids portion of a wastewater treatment plant. On the solid side, the hydrochar can be used as a soil amendment, uh, as an advanced biofuel, and some really cool uses for uh, technical carbons. Here's another slide showing a broader range of uses of hydrochar. Um, as I mentioned, it's a, a carbon neutral energy production uh, through combustion, gasification, and creation of biogas. Um, we are primarily focused on, at Phoenixville, we're primarily focused on hanging out in the sustainable building materials uh, circle here. So we're working with a number of industry partners um, in the state and that have international uh, businesses to integrate hydrochar into their building products. So we're looking at doing it in drywall, in asphalt shingles, as well as adding it to concrete as a fine aggregate replacement. All of those have the ability to sequester carbon away. Uh, the concrete one in particular is of interest. So answering a question um, from Joy, um, can this technology be retrofitted to existing plants? Yes. Uh, it very easily gets attached to wastewater treatment plants because it functions as the biosolids processing portion of the plant. Um, here's a, a process flow diagram of the Phoenixville treatment plant. There's a, a lot going on here, but you essentially have primary treatment, secondary treatment, anaerobic digesters, um, and then it goes to a centrifuge. It's dewatered and sent out to land application. HTC gets inserted right here at this solids treatment and will be uh, taking, the, taking over the anaerobic digestion process at the Phoenixville wastewater treatment plant. So from our block flow diagram, this is what HTC looks like. We have a live bottom storage hopper that holds the dewatered material that feeds into the system. From piston pump to buffer tank, it is a closed system. So no emissions come off in the system whenever it is heated or whenever reactions are taking place. Any emissions come off at the buffer tank here um, or malodors potentially coming from the buffer tank um, which is holding a bunch of sewage sludge. Um, we have activated carbon drum scrubbers that uh, handle those odors. Um, and from my experience being at the wastewater treatment plant and being around hydrochar, HTC smells much better than, than raw sewage. I, I can say that for a fact. Um, in our HTC process, we have a pump that moves the material through the entire system. Uh, we have a, a system uh, for heat recovery. So this takes the incoming material from about room temperature, let's call it 15 degrees Celsius, up to about 150 Celsius. Um, and then it goes through an ancillary heater here. Um, this is where our bread and butter is. And this is heated by a thermal oil heater. So when we have, this is where we have an introduction of fossil fuel usage into the system. Uh, we're using at maximum capacity 1.33 MMBTUs per hour. Um, of natural gas. Um, this takes the material from about 150 up to about 180 to 220 Celsius. And that temperature delta that you that I'm mentioning really impacts the amount of natural gas that we're using. Um, coming out of the heaters, we're at reaction temperature, let's call it 200 degrees Celsius. We'll lose about five Celsius throughout the reactor. And that goes back through the heat exchanger, heating up that incoming material where it's then depressurized into a buffer tank. And then out to dewatering. Um, the dewatering device that we use is a um, 
It's called a Booker Press. I have a picture of it here in a couple slides. Um, from this, we're getting a total solids hydrochar of 50, 50 to 60% total solids, which is um, exceptional whenever it comes to sewage dewatering. And I'll show you why here on this next slide. Um, lastly, before going there, the process water will be going back to the headworks of the plant to be treated along with the rest of the incoming material. So here in this video, it's a bit choppy, but that is 20% solids primary sludge or 80% water is another way to look at it. Once that material goes through HTC, it becomes more of a slurry and that allows us to dewater it better. Um, so we are improving that dewatering efficiency considerably um, where a wastewater treatment plant, if you're getting 25 to 30% solids, you're doing very well in dewatering. Um, we're looking at 50 to 60% solids. In some cases, they've achieved um, higher percent solids than that. So we are having a 70 to 80% reduction in sludge volume from original feedstock to final product. Um, what that means is transportation on the back end, if it's going somewhere to be beneficially used, is significantly reduced. You're not trucking 80% water, uh, you're trucking 40% um, uh, water, 50% water. Um, but the material itself, doesn't really look wet. It's pretty interesting. The hydrochar comes out of the press more gravelly than cakey compared to biosolids. Um, if you haven't been around biosolids, it's it's kind of like a fluffy cake. And I'm sorry for the food analogies. Um, other impacts of HTC on sewage sludge and biomass is it increases the energy density of the material. So you go from a, a raw feedstock to an increased energy density and higher carbon concentration in that final hydrochar product. Um, industry people will recognize that not having a sticky phase when drying the material um, is a critical element and will make your operators very happy. Um, sewage sludge, when dewatered and then dried, has a sticky phase that's about 35 to 45 percent solids um, that can really gum up the, the dryer and becomes a headache for operation. Um, since we're getting past that and just completely changing the surface morphology and the interconnectedness and depolymerizing the polymer used in dewater and dewatering. Um, we don't deal with the sticky face whenever we're drying hydrochar. Um, since it is a high a thermal process, the material is pathogen free. We also see reductions or destruction of pharmaceuticals, and we see PFAS reduction in the solid matrix. Um, that's literature study that I can share. Uh, later on, we will need to confirm this uh, with our commercial scale processes. So this is the dewatering press that I'd mentioned. Um, the installation at the Barrera Phoenixville is the first time that this unit has been used in the U.S. for sewage purposes. It's primarily used in the juicing industry, um, but this allows us to get that very high dewatering efficiency as well as a very high solids capture rate. Um, and if anyone has questions about this, happy to share more information, um, but we'll move on. So these next couple slides are the most scientifically technical that we'll get. Um, and I promise you it'll be more high level after this. Um, but this is talking through how the carbonization process actually functions. So the first step in HTC is a hydrolysis reaction that takes place, which cleaves larger molecules and makes them more uh, chemically available later on in the reaction. So you can see here that water is one of the reactants, subcritical water, it's reactive, and it cleaves this large molecule and makes a carboxylic acid and, and an alcohol here. And both of these get acted on later in the reaction mechanisms. Here we have decarboxylation, which is the creation of CO2 gas. So whenever we get dinged for a carbon efficiency, this is one of the areas. We get about four to six percent of the carbon in the original feedstock makes its way out of the process as biogenic CO2. Next reaction is dehydration, which goes after hydroxyl groups or that OH group, um, creating water. So we're actually creating new water in this process. Uh, the goal of this reaction is making more stable compounds. So it's a double bonded carbon compound, and it makes a more stable, robust carbon compound. Um, that has higher staying potential than the original raw biomass. And then lastly is condensation reaction or repolymerization, which again creates water um, while creating larger molecules. So this builds that hydrochar solid matrix structure um, that makes up 
hydrochar, the product. Um, so these reaction mechanisms are talked about in a very high level standpoint, but the next two slides are really show the complexity of biomass transformation. Um, here we have some commonly known compounds, lignin, starch, tryptophan, uh, fatty acids, um, and then applying those chemical reactions to this becomes more challenging. And whenever you map it out, it looks more like this. So this is just a, a mess of chemistry um, that, that that's beyond me. <laughs> uh, but just to show that when reacting biomass and having um, various feedstocks coming in, the products that you make vary as well, with the overarching product being a more carbonized material. Um, so this is the last bit of technicalness. Um, this is comparing three different feedstocks and their resulting hydrochars um, through two different analyses. One is the proximate analysis, which is shown in the blue, red, and gray bars, which represent the volatile matter, fixed carbon, and ash content. And then the green, green dot is the higher heating value of the material. So the first thing to point out here is we have digestion or di digestate versus raw sewage sludge, primary sludge. Um, you can see that the digestate has a huge reduction in volatile matter, a huge increase in ash content, and that's due to anaerobic digestion doing its thing. It's removing some of those compounds, it's making methane, it's working, it's doing its digestion process. Um, sewage sludge has a lot more material and carbon able to be converted to a more stable carbon. Um, this again is even more exacerbated when looking at food waste. So in terms of digestion, we have food waste here, we have step one of digestion here, and we have step two of biological digestion here, um, showing how the feedstocks get acted on um, through those different digestion processes. Um, HTC, like I said earlier, causes carbonization and an increase in energy density. It does not really happen with digestate, and that's due to it already being processed. Um, with sewage sludge, we see an increase in energy density. We see an increase in fixed carbon. And with food waste, that is substantially more um, exaggerated. So we go from about 19 megajoules per kilogram for both to about 31 megajoules per kilogram or 23 megajoules per kilogram um, from sewage sludge and food waste. So when looking at using this material as a solid fuel, integrating mixed food waste, keeping food waste out of landfill, and putting it into the HTC process to blend with sewage sludge is a big benefit to increasing energy density as well as decreasing ash content associated with your solid product. So how does hydrochar stack up to other solid fuels? Um, the obvious one is coal. So looking on the right side here, we have uh, lignite and hydrochar made from raw sewage. These stack up against each other um, in terms of heating value as well as ash content. Um, as we go up the ladder, mixed food waste is more aligned with subbituminous coal and bituminous coal, where in the cleanest feedstocks that we've tested, which was spent grain from a distillery, um, we have very, very high heating dips or heating value and very, very low ash content. So this material um, greater than anthracite coal. This chart here is a good representative to show the material that you are processing through HDC dictates the material you get out of HDC and the hydrochar characteristics associated with it. Um, one of the biggest benefits to using hydrochar, aka biogenic coal or bio coal, is that it has a net zero carbon emission factor associated with it in terms of carbon accounting. So if we're thinking about coal that's been buried in the ground for however many million years, we dig that out, we combust it, we're adding carbon to the current carbon cycle. The hydrochar that we're making was made from today's carbon cycle. So it's akin to a forest uh, dropping its leaves in the fall, having them degrade in the forest, taking in more carbon the next year. Uh, we're functioning in today's carbon cycle as opposed to the fossil carbon cycle when we make hydrochar and whenever it is used as a solid fuel. So I touched on earlier about how HTC varies from anaerobic digestion and other processes. It also plays very well with them. So if you can integrate HTC and anaerobic digestion together, you benefit both technologies. So if you take the process water or biosolution out of HTC and send it back to an anaerobic digester, 
it's shown to produce up to 30% more biogas. So these two play very well together. Um, also, if you take organic waste, send it through HTC and send all of that through anaerobic digestion, you can get up to 300% more biogas and it lowers the hydraulic retention time of the material than you would from the original feedstock going into the digester. And this was a lab study done um, out of some excellent HTC scientists out of Italy, um, looking at the organic fraction of municipal solid waste. So this will vary, these numbers vary uh, considerably at commercial scale and depending on the feedstocks that are used. Um, when pairing HTC with pyrolysis or gasification is where the energy efficiency um, of HTC really shines in converting wet organic waste to beneficial use products. So HTC uses 60% less energy than just drying of that material alone. And that's due to the high dewaterability associated um, with that hydrochar product. Um, because of that efficiency, the dryer unit um, can be 80% smaller and the gasification unit can also be reduced in size. So pairing HTC with pyrolysis to make biochar or gasification for energy production is more energy efficient than just drying of that original organic matter or, or the sewage sludge or food waste in this case, and then pyrolyzing and gasifying it itself. Um, so PFAS is always talked about at every industry conference I've been to. Um, and here's what I can share uh, about it today in terms of HTC and PFAS. Um, this is a study done out of Germany and it was hydrochar, not biochar. There's a big difference between the two and I just wanna make that clear before moving on. Um, it showed that there was a reduction in PFAS in the solid matrix by about two thirds. Um, in this study, the process water was not tested. Um, so there's still more work yet to be done in finding an overall closed uh, mass balance around fluorine compounds in sewage sludge through HTC. Um, and this is an enormous undertaking. Um, the science around tracking PFAS is very difficult due to the sheer number of PFAS. And um, at every industry conference I go to, it seems that the mass balance of PFAS tracking through X technology is always teased. So a lot of people are working on it and PFAS tracking is getting better. Um, and we look to have additional information on this um, later on down the line as well. All right, so that's it for technical bits. And we'll talk about what's happening at the borough of Phoenixville and how we're implementing HTC at their wastewater treatment plant. So the borough of Phoenixville um, is a relatively small borough um, at about 17,000 people. Um, while small, they are uh, mighty and super progressive. So I, I give them props having worked with their uh, borough council and inf infrastructure team, as well as the superintendent at the wastewater treatment plant for a number of years now. Um, the borough was the first municipality in Pennsylvania to pledge 100% clean renewable energy by 2035, which was a uh, ready for 100 goal. Um, and they were the first to do it in the state. In this project, if we go through yet with gasification, um, will help them attain that goal. So the wastewater treatment plant is, is not special. It's a, a small treatment plant that averages about 1.75 MGD. They make a class B biosolid product which gets, which gets land applied and actually unique to the areas. They have a pretty low disposal cost of only about $47 per ton. Um, as noted, they only made, they made under a thousand tons of biosolids this year. Um, and that's due to some of their anaerobic digestion changes um, that they're dealing with. The timeline that we've been on at the borough um, started in 2019 with engineering and design. Um, we're currently working through the final steps before we can start the system up. So we did functional commissioning, made some hydrochar, shut it down, or finalizing some, some items of the system, and we'll be starting up uh, in the next month or two. Over 2023, we have to work to prove these beneficial use cases and get that ingrained in permits, allowing us to function and sell material. Um, looking forward to 24, 25, um, we'll be assessing if a phase two is appropriate um, and they wanna pursue gasification, um, which brings in food waste in the system as well. From a permitting standpoint, 
They are approved under a permit by rule to act as a captive municipal waste processing facility. This means that hydrochar that we make in the state of Pennsylvania is still considered a waste and it must be stored on site um, until we can prove that it can even be landfill or land applied meeting um, the various biosolids regulations. Um, only until it is de-wasted or approved by DEP can we even landfill or land apply this material. Um, it meets the solid fuel requirement of 5,000 BTUs per pound easily. Um, so getting that approved will be um, easy to send it out as a solid fuel. Um, but during this PBR permit by rule, we're able to do beneficial use testing with our, our various industrial partners to build those beneficial use cases and build that market for the hydrochar material. Um, hydrochar will be de-wasted and allow us to, or allow the borough to send the material out for the various beneficial uses only under an individual or general permit. Um, so permitting is going to be one of our next big focuses. As soon as we start up, we'll be gathering data that they want, um, as well as building the market for this material. So we've talked about kind of a phase one, phase two approach, where phase one is just having sewage sludge go through HTC, we make a hydrochar, we build that beneficial use case. In phase two, we'll be introducing food waste. As I mentioned earlier, it makes a better solid fuel um, and gasification, which will in the end be a net energy producing process at the wastewater treatment plant. So to answer John Hall's question, we will be taking food waste in this process. Uh, and the borough certainly has that goal. Um, the borough is unique in that they handle their own trash hauling. So they were they will be able to set up food waste days uh, or set up programs to haul food waste um, that will be depackaged and processed at the wastewater treatment plant. Um, taking in food waste to a wastewater treatment plant is also a permitting question. Um, so DEP needs to give the borough a blessing to be able to do that. So let's talk economics for a couple slides. This is essentially the current state at the borough of Phoenixville. They have make a class B biosolid, they pay to dispose of it, about $45,000 a year. They also heat their anaerobic digesters um, at a tune of about $83,000 per year. Um, so they're not accepting hauled waste at the moment. Economics at the treatment plant in the past have been better with both AD units functioning, bringing in hauled waste, um, but with no additional hauled waste, economics are on a steady decline. HTC is replacing that upgraded AD infrastructure that would have come in at about 2.5 million, which would have been a new roof on the digester, um, allowing them to continue to make a class B biosolid and pay to dispose of it. Um, their boilers aren't efficient and they have to heat their boilers with natural gas. So they flare all of their biogas generated from inner digestion, while taking in natural gas from the grid to power and heat their mesophilic anaerobic digesters. Looking at phase one of the HTC project, the capital cost of equipment are around 3.3 million with caveats. Um, that other project costs will vary based on available infrastructure. The borough already had a building, they already had sludge dewatering, already had a conveyor, and those, depending on what treatment plant you're at, could be used or not used. Um, if they have that existing infrastructure. Additionally, discounts were given to the borough um, from various manufacturers for the equipment being installed in this um, being the first HTC plant um, in the U.S. and actually all of North America. So there's incentive by those manufacturers to get this process up and running and future capital costs will be more. Um, construction costs were about 1.2, engineering permitting uh, about 600,000. And unique to the borough situation is they secured about a million dollars in grants. Um, so kudos to them. They got about $400,000 from Chester County and about $650,000 um, from the state of Pennsylvania H2O PA grant. Um, so the county likes what we're doing. The state likes what we're doing. Uh, we we're a national DOE award-winning technology. So we have support from all levels of the, of the government here. Um, so this was a question um, was added because Carol Kinney had asked about the, the cost of implementation and also asked about what grants are available for, for the system. Um, while not a grant, the IRA, Inflation Reduction Act, has tax credits available for bioenergy production projects. 
um, up to about 40% uh, return as a transferable tax credit, which is new in the IRA that municipalities are able to use this tax credit and transfer it um, to tax paying entities. So realize I'm running a little bit long and want to have some time for Q&A. So let me get through these last bits of uh, economic slides. Um, here, I'm showing phase one with varying flow rate through the system. You can see how electricity use and natural gas use increases with flow rate, um, but that is outpaced by the tip fees associated with um, bringing in hauled waste. So the Phoenixville system, the HTC system, um, was designed for additional capacity to bring in hauled waste. And to date, it only the Phoenixville sludge only accounts for about 15% of the material going into the system at full capacity. Um, so what do these economics look like? In blue, we have the current state. In orange and gray, we have the two varying scenarios of flow rates um, for the HTC process of phase one. Um, so with those two different processes or those two different flow rates, we're landing somewhere in between that range um, with a bunch of caveats around tip fees um, and how the borough manages their hauled waste. So we're looking at a delta of about 7.4 to 12 million over a 20 year period. So looking at energy use and greenhouse gas emissions associated with this process on a per unit basis, so per dry ton of material process, HTC uses about 70% less natural gas than the current state. So this isn't to say it uses overall less natural gas since we're processing much more material, we use an increase in natural gas, um, but on a per unit basis, it's significantly less. Uh, we do see an increase in electricity use. Um, HTC allows for an increase in water recovery by improving the dewaterability of the, the final material. Um, and then also HTC creates a biogenic carbon derived product, hydrochar, that can be used for carbon sequestration events. So what does that look like? Taking into account the CO2 emissions associated with the electricity use and the natural gas use, um, and then taking into account the potential for carbon sequestration of the hydrochar, we're looking at a net reduction in CO2 emissions overall at the tune of about 1,600 tons to about 2,400 tons of CO2e, um, given in the seven and 10 gallons per minute flow rates. Um, this needs to go through fully vetted LCA, and these are high level estimates. Um, but this goes to show that HTC can be used as a powerful tool uh, to efficiently create biogenic carbon sequestration. So moving into phase two, where we introduce food waste, depackaging unit, um, dryer, gasification. That's what these economics look like, about an additional $2.8 million. But by creating uh, bioenergy, you're unlocking up to 40% uh, tax credit of the total project costs. Um, and that makes a significant difference in the economics of the overall process. And we'll show that here in a slide. Um, in, this, in this scenario, it is a net energy producing process, meaning it covers all electricity of the HTC process and most of, or all and then some, of the overall wastewater treatment plant energy use. So the wastewater treatment plant operations are estimated at about 1,600 megawatt hours per year. Um, at seven gallons per minute, we're reaching about 92% of that, as you can see here at this number. And then at 10 gallons per minute, up to about 140% of the energy use. Um, so there's some questions, um, how much of the borough's power can be offset and can it turn a profit for the borough? Um, we are exceeding the wastewater treatment plant energy demand and depending on how the borough manages that energy production and that project um, will dictate how much additional energy it can offset. The original goal was to hit that mark of taking their wastewater treatment plant offline and offsetting that energy production. Their wastewater treatment plant was their largest energy user. And by wiping it out um, from energy use, it really gets them closer to their 2035 goal. Um, caveats of this are, depending on the ratio of food waste going in, uh, will dictate the amount of energy used. With higher food waste ratios, you see more energy produced. Um, this was modeled at a 50-50 ratio. And then 35% of the sin gas was used to go back and heat the HTC process, um, removing that operating cost. 
So finally, before we get to some pictures, um, this is the economics of phase two. So you'd see a lower uh, phase two with these two, uh, sorry, these two at the bottom are just as is, and these two are with that 40% IRA tax credit. Um, you can see much better economics than the, the current state um, while reaching one of their sustainability goals. So here are some pictures of the HPC process during the state of construction, and then we'll be opening up to, to questions. So this was uh, right before equipment was placed in April of last year. Um, and the HPC process takes up about half of the greenhouse that's currently on site. This is what the HPC layout looks like. Uh, we have the live bottom hopper on the right side here. We have the heat exchanger, heaters, reactor, um, the thermal oil heater here and the dewatering press here that moves the hydrochar out and away from the system. So some pictures of those units. Here's a live bottom hopper, it holds about one day's capacity of sludge to be moved into the system. Um, the piping here is some pressure regulation within the system. Uh, we can not go into the weeds on that. Um, here's a picture of the piston pump, as well as our heater skid, our heat exchanger, and our reactor. So they're skidded units, easily transported. Um, here is interior of our heat exchanger. It's a pipe and pipe dual zone heat exchanger. A little overhead shot of the wastewater treatment plant. And then the buffer tank that holds the hydrocharged slurry um, that holds it leading into the dewatering press. So up until here, it's a continuous process. And then from here through dewatering, it's a semi-batch process to get the hydrochar dewatered. Another view of the Bucher press. Um, and wrapping it up with the high level benefits of implementing HTC at the borough of, of Phoenixville. Um, so by no longer land applying the hydrochar, which is one of the goals um, in implementing this process, we're reducing regulatory risks. Um, there's been a lot of talk about PFAS and land application and potential outlawing of that. Um, and this gets them ahead and beyond any regulatory risk associated with land application. It's taking the borough's sludge and its wastewater treatment plant and turning it into an asset. So instead of being a cost sink with negative economics, it has the potential to be a revenue generating center uh, and taking their organic wastes and making a sellable product out of it. It's also meeting their sustainability goals by creating renewable energy and taking their wastewater treatment plant offline. Um, it's also increasing their solids processing capacity. So that really allows for them to make energy that offsets their energy load uh, is by bringing in additional solids into their plant. Just from their sludge alone, they would not be able to make enough energy to run their process or run their wastewater treatment plant. Um, and then lastly, um, by creating energy, you can unlock up to 40% uh, tax credits. Um, and that's a new thing due to the IRA. If you want more information, you can check out our website. You can check out the PXV Neo website, um, as well as a YouTube video, which has almost a million views, which is pretty cool. Um, it was done by Matt Farrell, um, where Dan Spracklin was interviewed. Um, and then another interview here, uh, where Dan Spracklin goes in depth about starting up the business and um, getting into HTC. So I know I was shooting for 30 minutes. I hit 45. So sorry, Bill. Uh, but with that, I open up the questions and look forward to hearing you all's feedback. Thank you, Jeremy. Appreciate this uh, excellent overview. Trying to understand a little bit more. I'm going to have to go back to some chemistry class. Um, thanks. Um, Alex, I think there was one question I chatted to at the beginning that came from Registry. If you don't mind starting with that. Sure. Yep. I got a couple of questions here. Um, the first question we have is, are there any particular roadblocks that would make it difficult or impossible for a wastewater treatment plant to pursue moving to become an energy producer? So to become an energy producer at the treatment plant, I think it's critical to be able to accept hauled waste. Um, and the wastewater treatment plant superintendent or operators need to be um, open to doing that. Um, additionally, it's going to take some permitting maneuvers to allow the wastewater treatment plant to take in that additional waste, especially if we're talking about mixed organic or food waste. Um, and it takes a um, really um, municipal leadership that wants to do it. Um, so if, if you're in a municipality that has 
leaders that are stuck in the race and happy to just keep moving forward with the status quo, um, that's will definitely be a deal breaker for, for your, your municipality um, because it takes leadership and progressive leadership to want to pursue this. And Jeremy, Excellent. I'm gonna uh, direct chat um, six questions to you if you don't mind reading them. Um, so we got six questions from Mike. Um, where is the biochar currently going and for what use? Do you have to pay to get rid of it or do you get paid and how much per ton? Um, so I want to make the, the clear distinction that hydrochar and biochar are different. Um, they have different uses, different surface morphologies, um, different heating values and are made in, in, in different ways. Um, so currently, um, the hydrochar is being used for uh, pilot industrial uses to prove those beneficial use cases. Um, we don't have a price per ton for it. And the goal is obviously to get paid for it. Um, but the borough sees it as a success if they can just get it off site without paying to, to move on from that. Um, is it expected that any of, I'm a, Mike, I'm going to summarize some of your questions. Um, is it expected that the hydrochar will be marketed to be burned as a fuel in cement kilns or other combustion facilities? Uh, yes. Answer is yes. It meets renewable solid fuel standards in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, yes. Does your project require and have air or race permits from DEP? If so, what name are they under and can you share copies? Um, so as described in the presentation, we're functioning under permit by rule. Um, I'm not sure about the name of that, and I can look into it if you'd like to see the permit by rule. Um, but I discussed the um, the constraints that we're functioning under with that permit. Um, it does not require an air permit as is. And that's we're under the thresholds and de minimis emissions associated with uh, methane, NOx emissions. Um, if we move on to phase two that requires or is using gasification, um, I fully expect there to be um, air permits. Um, the waste permit is the permit by rule, and we still have to meet the MPDES permits associated with any wastewater treatment plant. How frequently are the air emissions tested for greenhouse gases, toxic metals, dioxins, acid gases, particulate matter, NOx, SO2? Where can we obtain these test results? Um, so we're not doing gasification currently, and these test results are are not not available. They're, we we have not tested gasification of this specific material, uh, and don't have that to share. Uh, when we do, we'll be going through the the proper methods of sharing with DEP and going through air permitting um, as required. How frequently is the hydrochar tested for toxic metals, dioxins, pHs? Where can we obtain these test results? Um, so we did some preliminary testing on the hydrochar uh, for DEP for the permit by rule. Um, that's not publicly available information. Um, we can we can discuss in offline, and I can share it with you then if you'd like to see it. Um, the heavy metals associated with hydrochar are representative of the heavy metals associated with the feedstock that it was used to make, used to be made. Um, so it, it will follow similar uh, biosolids testing regulations, um, which I think the borough has to do quarterly, and that changes based on throughput of a given wastewater treatment plant. Um, so I mean, we'll be going through those, those testing methods constantly, sending data to DEP and staying um, in line with our beneficial use permit when we get there. Um, the last question is about PFAS, and I addressed that uh, in the presentation. OK, Alex, uh, do you have some more questions? I do have a few more questions here. All right, so on slide 11, of your presentation, it states that PFAS, uh, states PFAS reduction. Can you say more about this? Like, are the PFAS filtered out or are they destroyed? Um, yes, so my, my understanding, and 
preface that with, I'm not a PFAS expert, is that at the levels or the temperatures that we're processing at, there is some degradation uh, potentially to lower or smaller chain PFAS compounds. Um, and those were not held in the solid matrix. So I don't think we do any like total destruction of PFAS. I think that it's a, a movement from um, solid matrix to, to liquid in the form of smaller chain compounds and being released from the solid matrix. That's my understanding. Thank you. All right, got a few more questions. Um, there is also PFAS reduction funding in the IIJA. Um, would this project qualify? Um, I would have to see what the PFAS reduction criteria is. Mm -hmm. um, typically with grants and funding, the, the criteria is pretty tight. Um, so I'd have to see. And if whoever asked right. that question, if you have that information, feel free to pass it on to me. <laughs> Amazing. All right. So um, this is a question from Brian Munley. He says, my team and I have been in touch about PICO incentives. Do you have a size in megawatts of the CHP cogeneration plant? Yeah. Um, so Brian, I don't have that exact number. And, and my expectation is that it's going to be under a megawatt. Um, let me, I'll pull up my, um, some of my data that I was working on today, see if I can give you a better answer. Um, expectation is going to be, sorry, doing this on the fly. Um, probably about 250 kilowatt is that the expectation there. Um, uh, but that's, that's TBD. Excellent. Thank you. Um, is there any methane released from this process? There's not methane generated during HGC reactions. Um, we do use natural gas to heat the thermal oil heater, um, but no methane is generated in the process. So you're not going to have fugitive methane emissions like you would associated with uh, other biosolids handling processes. Awesome. All righty. Uh, let's see. We have question here. Is there an expected dollar amount for what this project saves Phoenixville when it's at full capacity, including disposal fees, energy reduction, sale of biochar, electricity to get to the grid? Um, yeah, so that's a currently modeled um, showing the 20 year uh, project timeline. Uh, and I think it was about 7.5 to 12 million um, as a phase one project. Um, phase two economics were a little bit different in um, if it is a, a savings, it is a, a net money or revenue producing process uh, for the borough um, compared to their, their current state of operations. Thank you. All right. You um, mentioned use in concrete applications as replacement of small aggregates. Does biochar react with the cement in any way? Um, No is the expectation. Um, in any way, there might be some reactions that take place. Um, and I, I don't want to definitively say that. Um, but we did testing with the University of Villanova, and it acted as an inert filler. Um, and the only only change in mixing the the concrete up um, was that it absorbed a little bit more water than what sand would. Um, and that was the only uh, negative impact to it. But up to concentrations, um, upwards of about 10% of sand replacement, um, the concrete functioned uh, relatively similar to its um, standard base. Excellent. All right, uh, let's see. Does this process create hydrogen? Um, the HTC process doesn't. Gasification can be tuned for hydrogen generation. Um, it's not something that Sumax is really pursuing, um, but our gasification partners are. Um, so gasification is needed to make that hydrogen, um, and different types of gasification can be used to really have a pronounced hydrogen production, such as like, uh, I think steam injection is one way to do it and increase hydrogen production. That's a little bit outside my expertise. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, but we are uh, not pursuing that at, at Phoenixville. Okay. So... Let's see, this one's kind of a two-part question. Um, 
I'm curious if there are any limitations on the processing due to chemicals and in input water. I, I think, so I imagine that individuals using cleaners, et cetera, are fairly minor, but many, maybe some different industries in the municipality that put larger quantities of chemicals in the water. So have you seen any issues with this or any impact? Um, so we haven't done a lot of industrial waste processing. Um, okay. My expectation is that some chemicals would certainly impact the reactions that take place. Um, I mean, there's tons of literature about catalyzed reactions with different, um, like fair chlorides, different acids, bases, and how that impacts the um, carbonization reactions. Um, but I, yeah, it's a, a very broad question. And I would expect, yes, that if there is significant uh, industrial chemicals in the water to be treated or in the biosolids, because that's what we're functioning under, um, that it could have impacts on the, the final product and the characteristics of it. Interesting, yeah. All righty. Um, do you think it will be possible in the future to heat the material with electricity yeah. instead of natural gas? Yeah, definitely. Um, so the, the uh, thermal oil manufacturer that we're using, they have an electric system as well. Um, and that, that could be used. Uh, which opens the door for purchasing renewable energy and then having it be a fully renewable energy project to make the hydrochar. Um, it's set, definitely something we're pursuing and have looked at at other applications mm -hmm. of this technology. Excellent. Those are, the, those are all the questions I have at the moment. Um, Jim or Dan, did uh, either of you receive any questions directly that Alex may not have seen? I, I did not, but I, I have a question if I could uh, ask. Um, do you know if uh, Phoenixville Borough or SOMAX has a plan to set up air monitoring uh, equipment to, be, you know, to get baselines before you get started and to monitor after? Um, I don't think that that is currently in the works. Um, we will be doing stack testing or not. So yeah, we will be doing emissions testing from the buffer tank. Um, that's a, what, what one thing you want to do to look at the emissions associated with the HTC reaction by itself. Um, but I don't think that there's like overhead emissions testing planned at the treatment plant. You don't have a concern about, uh, you know, whoever's downwind? Um, um, from honestly. HTC reactions? No, no. Um, it, it's primarily CO2 with some carbon monoxide. Uh, and then you're going to get some uh, ammonia emissions associated with it. And it's nothing outside of what would be happening at a wastewater treatment plant in terms of uh, compounds coming out of that. You do have some um, probably odorous ketone type compounds coming off, but it's not at any concentration that causes um, a concern. And we've been in contact with uh, PADEP um, air department and shared results from the emissions associated with the HTC reaction alone. Um, and there's been zero concerns. Okay, thanks. That's all I have for. Yeah. Um, there was one uh, earlier, actually, I missed. Um, Jeremy, are there any projects or in the queue in Pennsylvania or the United States that you are going to work on next? Uh, we do have a, a number of interested municipalities um that i will not be naming um not not sure I, I i can um but yeah a number of municipalities are interested and we are in some early stages in project development and and just in terms of that elapsed time how long does it usually take to get started with a project at a municipality yeah so i don't think that what took place at phoenixville will be representative of further or future projects um, hopefully there won't be another pandemic um, causing massive delays in equipment shipping. Um, and if we're functioning in Pennsylvania, the DEP will be um, more aware of what we're doing and there'll be less of an education climb there. Um, and depending on the permits in, P in PA that we get, um, we'll be able to move much faster. So from PO to um, up and running, I would put it in the range of uh, 16 to 24 months. I don't know, it's still a pretty broad range, um, but that's about the timeline of 
from a PO moving forward. There's early steps in that, um, such as talking to um, borough councils, um, local groups as well, um, education around that, getting ahead of permitting is another thing, and then also proving feasibility and ass assessing the goals of the municipality that you're gonna be functioning at. Um, one municipality I talked to only had the goal of continuing the land apply. So not interested in any of the carbon sequestration potential, any other beneficial uses, not interested in energy, and they just wanted to continue to land apply. Um, so depending on the approach by the municipality really dictates the uh, approach of permitting and the additional processing that may be taking place on that on that hydrogen. Great, thank That's you. Kind of a long-winded answer, but. Appreciate that. Uh... And I'm sure we'll learn more as we go forward. We'll be interested in maybe having a, a touch point with you at some point in the future to see what you've learned on this project so you can help us uh, appreciate the value that it offers. Um, I think at this time we've reached our hour. If you're able to stay on, um, Jeremy, I'll um, stop the recording. But if there's anyone that has questions, we can... Uh...